I want to be able to share with you for a few moments from, from Luke chapter 10. And in this passage here, we're given some, some great instruction from Jesus on how we can help hurting people. Now, maybe you're in here tonight and you're thinking, well, I, I don't know anybody that's fatherless. I don't, know a, I don't know a single mom. I don't know a grandparent raising grandkids. Well, I want to encourage you to pray about it while we, while we talk through this and think about who in your life has God placed, strategically placed in your life that you could help. You know, we all have people that God has strategically placed in our lives that, that need some hope, that need some help, right? That God has placed there. And when I say strategically, I really mean that because there are coworkers, there are family members, there are neighbors, there's people all around us that God has strategically placed there. It could be in your school and they're in your classroom. And maybe it's somebody that you think's a, a nice person in your school and you're a teenager and you're thinking, you know, this kid's annoying. Well, maybe it's somebody you could help. Maybe they're going through a rough home situation. Maybe they're struggling through something. Somebody you can minister to, that you can encourage, that you can, can be a part of their life. And in this passage, it's going to show you how you can reach out to their life. Now, I'm here tonight to represent the fatherless. I'm here tonight to rep- be an advocate for the fatherless because, as you saw in the video, I grew up without a dad. And I'm very passionate about helping other people that are going through that because I know how hard it can be. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm fatherless. I'm growing up without a dad, too. Or, um, and there's many, many millions of individuals that are they have a dad physically present in their house, but he's mentally, emotionally, and spiritually absent. And maybe that's you. And it's hard. Maybe you know of somebody like that. Maybe you are that dad that you've been absent from your kid's life and you, you're there physically, but you're not there mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I want to encourage you to be the dad that God's called you to be. Step up and be that dad that they need, that your kids need. You get one shot at it. Step up to the plate and hit a home run on that. Now, if you are the teen or the child that's going through um, not having a dad in your life, whether they're, they are physically present and they're, they're absent mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, or they're completely gone, or you see them occasionally, I know how hard it can be. There is hope, though. There's hope through Jesus Christ. God will give you the, the encouragement that you need, but I'm going to encourage you, cling to God. I'm not just some person up here just saying that, just trying to tell you, hey, you can get through it. I made it through it through God, and and I am not a perfect person by any means, but through Jesus Christ, through God helping me through being fatherless, I'm standing in front of you tonight. It's only through God. If you knew me as a teenager, you would have thought, there's no way Sean is ever going to do anything worth anything, okay? But through God, I was able to do that and able to overcome fatherlessness. And you can too. Use your story for something great. Use your, 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 the situation you're in for, for something good to help others. Whatever situation you're in, if there's now, if maybe you're thinking, well, I have a good home, well, encourage the other people that are around you because there probably are fatherless kids in your class. There probably are kids that are dealing with home issues in your class, and you can be the light to their life, and you can bring them into this church. You can help work with them. You can help disciple them on their journey. But Luke chapter 10, let's look at this passage here. It says in verse 29, But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Two very sad verses. These individuals should have helped. You know, we look at them like the, the priest and the Levite, but we need to look at them as if they're Christians where they should have helped, just like us. doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. doesn't does not, not matter, but we, if you're a Christian tonight, we as Christians have a job to do to reach out to people's lives and help them along the way, the ones that God has strategically placed in our, along our path. Look at verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. This is our example. It says in verse 34, look what he did. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him in his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing us to come here tonight. I thank you for allowing us to be able to speak here at Fellowship. I thank you for this church partnering with us so many years ago, and I pray that you would help us to continue. 
I pray that you please just, just bless this time. Please just speak to, if there's anybody that's in here that's fodless, help them to, to overcome it through you. Help them realize that the only hope there is, is is through Jesus Christ. And then walking with you and clinging to you and understanding that regardless of what their earthly parent, whether their dad or mom or both are gone, there's hope in you. And it's the only true hope we have in this earth. I pray that you please just help us as Christians to reach into the fatherless individuals' lives that are around us and do what we can to minister to them, to be present, to help them, to not be like the priest and the Levite, to be like the Samaritan. Lord, we love you. Speak to me now. I pray that you be from you. Rid me of myself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight I want to give you three steps that we all can take to reach the fatherless or if the Holy Spirit leads differently, the hurting individuals in your circle of influence. So maybe you're thinking, well, there's people in my life that are hurting. There's different individuals. Well, think about those people. Pray about those people while we talk about this tonight. Think about how, who you can help and how, how they can be helped and work through it. The first step is to reject apathy. Reject apathy. I was in eighth grade, and my eighth grade teacher said, hey, I was one of those kids who was always getting in trouble in school, and um, that's not a good thing, but I was. And who's my, who's my individuals that you got, when you were in school, you got in trouble, or maybe you're getting in trouble now? Raise your hand if you get in trouble in school, or you did. Come on, adults, be honest with me. Anybody, I see your hand back there. Anybody else? Anybody know who my people are, okay? I see you. Thank you for being honest, okay? Anybody else? Chris, definitely probably you, okay? Anybody else, okay? Anybody else? Okay, so I see a few hands. And so I was getting in trouble in school sometimes, and if that's you, you need to change and be good in school. But I, I, was, I had teachers that were keeping me in line and correcting me, and it was, it was, sometimes it was a bad situation. But this one time, he was just wanting to talk to me, and he said, Sean, I need to talk to you. You come here right now. I was in eighth grade, and he said, you have been apathetic. I was talking about eighth grade science. Eighth grade science said, you've been apathetic. I said, I've never heard that word in my entire life. I never, honestly, I never heard that word. I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm like, you're accusing me of something. I don't know what you mean. And he said, you've been apathetic. That means you don't care. And you don't care that you don't care. He's talking about eighth grade science. And I said, you are correct. I don't care. I did not care. You should care. If you're in eighth grade, you should care about science. If you're in school, you should care about science. It's good for you to learn. But I did not care about that at the time. And I, but I learned that day what apathy meant. And I learned that it's not something that's good for us to have in our lives. It's not good to be apathetic on issues that we should care about. And I realized I've seen in my adult life where I'm like, I've been apathetic about helping this one person. Or I've been apathetic about being in ministry in this one area or doing, doing this one thing or helping this one, this one um, individual that God's placed strategically in my life. And I've been apathetic about certain stuff that I know that I should change. And I think to myself, that's probably not the best way to be. And I realize I need to, to change the way I'm acting, the way I'm living, the way I'm being. And I need to reject apathy. We see here in this passage that these, this guy had been robbed, he'd been wounded, he'd been abandoned, he'd been left to die. I want to ask you, if there was somebody sitting out or laying out by the road here, you drove in, you saw them, and you drove right by. Can you imagine that? Imagine just driving right by. How would you feel if you saw somebody laying on the side of the road, robbed, wounded, abandoned, and left to die right out in front of the church here? I think you'd probably help, Right? You'd at least call 911. You'd think, you'd think you would do that. I mean, hopefully we would. Have somebody come and help them. Do something for them. But sadly, look what happened in verse 31. It says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This priest should have helped. But instead he let apathy control him. This is what I'm talking about with apathy. It can control us and keep us from doing what we're called to do. Verse 32 is the same way. This Levite guy, he said, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. And he passed by on the other side. He said, you know what? I see this guy, but I don't really have time for that. Let him die. I don't have time for that. But then we're encouraged by verse 33. Because it says, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. That's such an encouragement. 
That's where we're supposed to be. That's where we're supposed to act. That's how we're supposed to, 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 to live is by having compassion for others and, and helping them and encouraging them on their journey. I want to ask you, have you been like the priest or the Levite with people that God has strategically placed around you? Have you helped people that God has strategically placed around you? Are you showing them compassion? I was speaking at a church just south of here um, in Cincinnati last year, and I said, uh, is it south of here? Is that south, right, or southwest? I don't know. It's close to here somewhere, and I'm learning my states as I go. And, but I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm, as I'm traveling, I'm finding it out. But it's, I think it's like somewhere southwest. Anyways, it's, it's somewhere around here in Cincinnati. How far is Cincinnati from here? Two hours. Anyways, and so, so Cincinnati is down, is two hours away, and I went to this church speaking, and this uh, um, pastor gets up after I was done. He's like, you know what? I have a niece and a nephew that are fatherless. I didn't think about them until right now. Some of us have people right around us that we just, oh, that's, oh yeah, that's them. I had somebody message me the other day. They, they got a picture, their friend sent them a picture of our devotional, and they're like, and it was actually a family member of ours. And they're like, this is, is this your family member? I had the same last name. And she's like, yeah. She's like, oh, my, my mom bought me our this single mom devotional book that we have. And she gave it, she, I'm using it. It's really helping me. That's what she said. It was an encouragement to us as a ministry. My, but my, my family member, she said, I thought she would have already known about your ministry. You know, we have a responsibility just to go out and tell people that there's even resources out there that can help them. If you do nothing else after tonight, just get some of our cards and give them out to people that, that could use some hope. And it's, it's not like the, the God is my dad app and all that stuff. It doesn't like it costs anything. Just give them out. We have tons of them. That's why we print them up. Give them out to people so that they know that there's resources out there. That, and it has the gospel. It walks through how God will be their heavenly father. It has discipleship on it. It's just trying to, trying to help them on, on their journey. You know, I grew up without a dad, like I said on the video. And you saw, you, I even mentioned it. And it's my, it's my passion to help other people. But I'm not here for you to feel bad for me tonight. Because I, I got through it through God. But there's millions of other kids out there that are going through this situation themselves. They're struggling through it. They, 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 they have all kinds of, of struggles stacked against them. And, and they, they may become a statistic if they don't get through it. And, and they need some hope. And there's many statistics that show us what's happening in our nation and how it is the number one social issue in our country. And we see all these different statistics. I'm going to share them with you here in just a second. But I want you to understand before I share them that if you are in a fatherless situation or your friend is or somebody you know, if you're a single mom or grandparent raising grandkids, this is not what you have to become or the children around you have to become. This is what's happening when Jesus Christ is not in their life. So understand that. Understand this is not your destiny. This is just what's going on with, with individuals that are, that are not experiencing Jesus Christ, that don't have a local church that loves them. They don't have resources to help them to be discipled through it, to be encouraged. The first thing's crime. 85% of youth in prisons grew up in fatherless homes. 85%. 80% of rapists motivated with anger issues come from fatherless homes. Of the 27 deadliest mass shootings, 26 of them were fatherless. These are real numbers, real statistics, real studies are showing us that when a dad's not in an individual's life, there's a struggle. God set it up to be a mom and a dad, okay? And when mom or dad's not there, this is the way God set it up, mom or dad's not there, their life's off balance. But you as a Christian can come in their life and you can help bring their life back into balance and through Jesus Christ by giving them the hope of Jesus, by showing them that God will be their father and you can help bring their life back into balance through the local church. You can help with that. You can be a part of that. And I want to encourage you to be a part of bringing their life back into balance. Instead of just getting angry at what's happening in our nation, do you see all this stuff happening on the news? Do you see all these things going on? And instead of just complaining about it, be the solution. You know, many of these individuals you're seeing on the news, the struggles that are happening in our nation, we're like, what's going on? It's because many of these individuals that are contributing to some of the, the many of the, the problems we're facing right now, it's because they came from a fatherless home. And nobody ever taught them how to love others <coughs> or to respect themselves or to respect women or to how to be a respectable person in society. And when they don't have that, how are they supposed to know? But you can go in their life instead of complaining about them, go into their life and say, hey, this is how you can live. 
I'll be your mentor. I'll, I'll, I'll be your guide. I'll help you. I'll guide you on the right path. You know, just don't be like the priest and the Levites that just think it's just an issue that's in your way, on your path. Come alongside them and say, I'm going to help you. You know, issues such as homosexuality. It's a big issue today. There's a guy, in, there was a guy in California, he's passed away, but he was on Oprah, a very well-known psychologist. Um, and his name was Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. And his, actually his practice, what he did was, he would have individuals that would come to him and, and they would go to him and say, I have, I have these feelings, I don't want to have these feelings anymore. And they didn't want to be a homosexual anymore. So they would go to him and he, he worked with them and he worked through the different psychological issues that they had. And, and he's quoted as saying, I've worked with thousands of homosexuals. I've never seen one who had a loving, respectful relationship with their father. Does that mean that every homosexual comes from a father or something? No, there could be abuse. There could be, they got led by friends that got with the wrong group or whatever it might be. But they, they many times, a lot of times, they, they come from a home where they didn't have a good relationship with their dad. P.L. Adams said, boys who grew up in father-absent homes are more likely than those in father-present homes to have trouble establishing appropriate sexuals and gender identity. They don't have a man in their life to teach them how to be a man, okay? We as men can go into their lives and teach them how to be a man. Teen pregnancy. 71%, 71% of teen pregnancies come from fatherless homes. If you hate abortion, which you should as a Christian, go mentor a young girl before she even has to make that decision. Go reach into their life. Instead of walking around saying, hey, I hate abortion. I'm against it. You know, go do, be part of the solution. Go help a young girl before she has to make that decision or even after she, when she has to make that decision whether or not to keep the baby, go and mentor her and help her through the process. Help that young man. Guide him as, as he's with her and with the girl. Guide them through the process of, of keeping the child. Instead of getting angry about it, be the, the solution. Help them along the path. Some people tell, tell me this is from a certain economic background, a certain race, a certain side of the train tracks. I had people tell me that over the years with our ministry. Well, we don't have those kind of families in our neighborhood. That's, that's a lie. They're everywhere. Fatherless families, doesn't matter how much money you have or doesn't matter what, what race you are. It does not matter. Fatherlessness crosses all those boundaries. There's a study that says a white teenage girl from an advantaged background is five times more likely to become a teen mother if she grows up in a single mother household than if she grows up in a household with both biological parents. Because these girls, they need a dad there to show them that they're loved, to give them security. I've seen this in my own family. I've seen this with, my, with friends I've had, where they look for love in all the wrong places. Where dad should have told them they're beautiful. He should have been there to tell them he loves them. He should have been there to tell them he cares about them. He should have been there to protect them and he wasn't there. And so they go after some guy that doesn't care about them. That says, I'm going to provide security to you. That doesn't, want, doesn't really care about anything else but their body. And he hurts them. I want to encourage you, if you're in that situation, protect yourself from that. If you're in that situation, you have a girl that you're a single mom or a grandparent or grandkids, protect them from that. I've seen this so many times as I was in youth ministry or even in my own family where girls were hurt because they opened themselves up to a guy because they thought that guy was going to be that, that father figure in their life that they were looking for and it ended up just hurting them instead. Find your hope in God or help somebody find their hope in God. Find God as their father. Education and studies involving over 25,000 children using national representative data sets. Children who lived with only one parent had lower grade point averages, lower college aspirations, poor attendance records, and higher dropout rates than students who lived with both parents. I know that's a lot of information, but basically what it's saying there, that they don't do as good in school as the others because they don't have a dad there to tell them, hey, I, I believe in you, or hey, you can do better, or hey, why don't you bring that grade up, or hey, you can, why don't you go to school, okay, be involved in school, and they don't have that, that dad there to, to guide them and discipline them them and help them with that. So they just struggle through. The mom's just like, hey, I'm just, I'm just trying to get them by, okay? And so I'm trying to, trying to get them through, through school. And I'll be honest with you, that was one of my situations. My mom, was just, my mom and my grandma were just trying to get me through. And so they struggle through school. And when they struggle through school, if they don't get a good job, if they don't develop in society, they may rely on your tax dollars someday. It's just the, the, what happens. You know, it's the problem that we're facing in our nation. Three out of four teenage suicides occur in a household where a parent has been absent. 
Three out of four, three out of 14 suicides occur in a household where a parent has been absent. Suicide is never the answer. It's never the answer. I had a friend that took his own life. I actually just had a young girl that she didn't have a dad in her life. She took her own life. It's never, never the solution. It's never the answer to take your own life. It doesn't help in any way. The life you could have lived for God is, is gone. The life you could have lived to, to, to honor God and to praise God and to walk with God is gone because you were focused so much on other people. This young girl that just took her life recently, she struggled with depression. She struggled with trying to fit in. Her dad was absent from her life for many years. And so she made a decision to take her own life. Now they think that she was hoping somebody would come and rescue her before it all really finally took place, but it was too late. Her dad said afterwards, just recently, this was just about a month ago, her dad said, her dad, well, actually I was just talking to her brother before we left Pennsylvania, and her, her brother said, that my, I think my dad, this was a wake-up call for him. Well, I hope so. You know what I mean? So he made her fatherless, made the young girl fatherless. Some of these dads, they just don't care until it's too late. But you as a Christian can come alongside their life and say, hey, I care about you. And that might mean the difference. And what I'm saying here, what, what I want you to understand is you literally can save a life. You can save a child's life, a baby's life. You can, you can c- get crime out of your neighborhoods. You can, I mean, there's so many things you can prevent and help if you would just reach the fatherless around you. The last one was on the video. Fatherless children are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, suicide, Poor education performance, teen pregnancy, and criminality. Notice mental illness in there. And these, many of these studies, are, I did not come up with these. these are, this is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And look at it says mental illness right there. That, that is an issue that many children and teenagers are facing right now, and they're taking medication for that, which some of them have a chemical imbalance. Some of them need that, that help. But oftentimes, they just need a loving mentor to be their medication. Somebody come into their life and say, I believe in you. I believe you can do great. I believe, I believe in you. I, I, I hope I, I want, I'm here to help you. I love you. I care about you. And that is the medication they need. Even with drugs and alcohol, they can avoid those things if we would come alongside and say, there's a better way. You know, I believe in you and give them some purpose. Give them some hope. Understand that you don't need things to cope with your situation. You can overcome your situation. You can be the solution if you just reject apathy. Say, so, you know what, I'm not going to be apathetic about this issue. I'm not going to be like the priest and the Levite where they left this individual robbed, wounded, abandoned, and left to die. And as you can see from the statistics, that's the fatherless. The second thing is we've got to remit compassion. Letting compassion flow through our lives out to this hurting world. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, Sean, it's Wednesday night. I was coming here. I was hoping I was going to get a, a, a challenge for the rest of the week and encouraged. Now I'm stressed and depressed. Thanks a lot. That's not why I'm here, okay? I'm here because there is hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope in this situation for the individuals that are fatherless, for you as an individual trying to help them. There's hope in this. You can be a part of the number one problem in our country, the number one social issue in our country. You can be a part of helping these individuals. You can help them along the way and, and encourage them. Now, you know, remaining compassion. Compassion, the ultimate picture of compassion is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. He cared about you so much that he was willing to, to give his own life for you. The Bible says that God loved us so much, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you so much he gave his only begotten son to, to die on the cross for you. That's compassion. Who in here wants compassion in their life? Raise your hand if you want compassion. I want compassion. I, I love how, when compassion comes into my life. I, I, I love to receive compassion. You know, I, sometimes I, in my house, I'll uh, step on a Lego. Did you ever step on a Lego before? Right? Did you ever do that? Raise your hand if you've ever stepped on a Lego. Worst pain ever, okay? We should be using that in warfare. It's terrible pain. And, and so I'll step on a Lego. And you know what my family does? They come over and they say, oh, dad, or honey, you know, I, I, I'm so sorry. No, you know what they do? They laugh, okay? That's not funny. It's not funny when I step on a Lego and I'm doing the dance. Do you ever do the dance? Who does the dance when you get hurt? Raise your hand if you do the dance. And you're, you're like, oh, you know, you're doing the yell and the dance and the crying and the, the, the weeping and all these things. And it's such a pain to step on a Lego. I hate, oh, man, I have a lawsuit pending. I'm just kidding. But you, you, you step on this Lego and it just hurts so bad. It drives me crazy. 
And I want compassion for my family. We all want compassion in one way or another, don't we? We really do. Well, the ultimate picture of compassion, like I said, is Jesus Christ. And you can receive compassion. And here tonight, it would be a shame if I didn't share the gospel. And I want you to understand what compassion is. If you're in here tonight and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you. That's the most important decision you can ever make with your life. I had a guy tell me one time, I asked him to share his testimony in our, in our youth group in Pennsylvania. I was volunteer youth director back in 2010. And I said, hey man, would you just share your testimony? He was there before I even got there as a volunteer. And, and he, he looks at me, he lo- and he looks at a youth group or something like that, kind of, kind of how it went down. And he said, he said, I just have always gone to church. That was his testimony. You know, these church walls cannot save you. Just by sitting in that seat right now, it cannot save you. It's by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I had a teenager tell one of my youth leaders one time at a, at a, uh, a retreat, he said, my parents take care of that for me. Your parents cannot save you, okay? It's by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've got to realize you're a sinner, okay? Your sin's going to lead you to hell. You know, if you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're going to go to hell when you die. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. And he paid that penalty. You've got to realize you're a sinner, realize your sin's going to lead to hell. To believe in that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again, he paid the penalty for you. You've got to call upon Jesus to save you. It says in the, in the Bible, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to ask you, have you ever called upon Jesus to save you from your sins? Most important decisions you can ever make, and that's accepting compassion into your life from God. Now, if you're in here tonight and you have accepted compassion, you've accepted God's love for you, if you haven't, make sure you make that decision tonight. Most important decision, like I said. But if you have already made that decision, how's it going? You know, we become, sometimes we become stagnant in our faith, don't we? We keep it to ourselves. Who in here has ever heard of Spider-Man before? Raise your hand if you've heard of Spider-Man. Everybody's hands should be raised. We've heard of Spider-Man, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an American icon, okay? We've heard of Spider-Man before. And Spider-Man, now, contrary to some beliefs, I know there's different beliefs on this, but Spider-Man got bit by what? Okay, let's say it loudly. Spider-Man got bit by what? A spider. I like the enthusiasm up here. Okay, Spider-Man got bit by a spider, and he's able to, now contrary to some beliefs about different movies or whatever, but Spider-Man's able to shoot what? Webs, okay? Spider-Man's able to shoot webs. I know I get, I get different answers from some people. They're like, oh, he's a, it's a, there was a radioactive spider, and, and uh, I, I don't know. But in, if, if you look at this, he's, able to, he's bit by a spider, he's able to shoot webs, okay? Let's just keep it basic. And so he's able to shoot webs, he's bit by a spider. Now picture this, Spider-Man goes home, he sits in his living room, he's like, you know what, I'm going to watch a Batman movie. He just got bit, and he's able to do all these powers. He's like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to relax, watch a movie. He sits down, he's relaxing in his living room, he's watching a movie, hanging out, okay, just having a good time, and he's just, ha- just having fun. He's like, you know what, I'm thirsty. He's like, I could go for, what do you call it, pop or soda here, pop or soda? Pop, okay, he's like, you know what, I could go for a pop right now, I'm so thirsty. And so he's like, I don't want to stand up, and so he shoots a web into the kitchen, opens the refrigerator, shoots another web, pulls out a pop. And he's sitting there, he's just drinking his pop, just relaxing, watching Batman. And he thinks to himself, you know what, I'm so much better than Batman. I don't really care about this movie anymore. And he gets bored with it. So he goes outside and he's like, I've never been able to dunk a basketball before. But today is the day, right? Okay, I got webs coming out of my hands or whatever they're coming, or my wrists or whatever. I, got, I can do this now. So he shoots a web up to the backboard, pulls himself up, he dunks the ball. What a horrible Spider-Man movie that would be, right? Are you with me? Because Spider-Man is supposed to be out fighting crime. He's supposed to be out helping people and saving people. But instead, he's just keeping it to himself. Now, maybe it'd be funny for a few moments, you know, the movie. You'd be like, oh, this is kind of interesting. But it's like, this is not really what Spider-Man was created to be. That's the same thing with us as Christians. We trust in Jesus as our Savior. We get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that's put upon us. The power of God's upon us. And we go home with it and we keep it to ourselves. We treat it as a ticket out of hell instead of being able to go into this dark world and shining a light of Jesus Christ and saying, here, here's some compassion for you. and some compassion for you. and some compassion for you. Here, I'm going to love you. I'm going to care about you. I'm going to help you. Instead of that, we keep it to ourselves. Don't be like the bad Spider-Man, okay? 
Be, be, be the, the good Spider-Man where you're out helping people and helping save people through Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible talks about the fatherless. It says in Exodus twenty two twenty two, you should not afflict any widow or fatherless child. It says in Job twenty nine twelve, because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. Psalm 68, 5, I love this passage. It says, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. If you're fatherless, God will be your father. He'll care about you. He'll, he'll help you. He'll, he'll guide you. And I promise you, he does it for me all the time. That's my dad. It might sound corny. It might sound weird. But I'm telling you, if you embrace it, if you allow God to father you, he will. It's an amazing thing. It really is. He loves the fatherless. In his, in his holy habitation, he's fathering them. Psalm 146, 9, the Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless. Now, we as Christians, if we don't tell them about him, don't bring them to him, how's he going to relieve them? He expects us to bring them to him. That's how he set it up. We as Christians are supposed to bring people to Christ, to get saved, to bring them to God. Zechariah 7, 10, to press not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Malachi 3, 5, I'll come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against those that oppress the fatherless. I think God cares about the fatherless, right? He mentions them, mentions them in his scriptures. James 1, 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction to keep himself in spot from the world. Look what it says there. Pure religion. If you as a Christian want to grow as a Christian, this is a great place to start. Get rid of those, that traditionalism you have in your life. This is the way Christianity should be in the United States of America. No, the Bible says it's pure religion. This is something we should be focusing on. Pure religion and undefiled before God. It means we're not doing it for the wrong reasons. We're doing it in front of God and the Father. We're in front of the Heavenly Father, the one that, that loves us. He's our, our Father through Jesus Christ. So we're doing this in front of God it is to visit. That means to, to help, to look after, look upon in order to help or to benefit. The fatherless there can be translated, motherless, fatherless, or both. It's a pure religious practice for you and for me to visit the fatherless individuals that God has placed strategically in our lives. And this is the solution to the number one social issue in our country. And then it says, and widows. Widows there can be translated, a woman who's lost her husband due to death or abandonment. If you look it up, it's talking about a woman who's lost her husband, not translated, but a woman who's lost her husband due to death or abandonment. Single moms. My mom often felt like a single mom. Or, oh my mom, she felt like a single, she was a single mom. My mom often felt like a black sheep in our church as a single mom. She was looked at like she had like a scarlet letter on her because my dad walked away and divorced her and never came back. He moved from our hometown of Pennsylvania, went back to Las Vegas, never came back. And people looked at her like she was some ruined woman because of that. It wasn't her choice. She was a widow in this situation. It says in their affliction. Affliction there, we see the afflictions from the statistics, don't we? How they're struggling and the, the things they face in their life from the, from the studies that we just showed here. But you as a Christian can practice pure religion and go into their life and say, I'm going to minister to you. This is not a one-time thing. This is on an ongoing basis. Reaching into their life saying, I'm going to help them. We see the Samaritan man here. It says he had compassion on him in verse 33. Had compassion on him. I want to encourage you to remit compassion. Let it flow through your life. We can't stop there. We can't just say I reject apathy. I'm going to let compassion flow through me. I don't travel around in an RV for you to say, oh, those poor little fatherless kids. You know what I mean? I'm not, that's not why I'm doing this. I'm serious. I, I would, that, would be, that would be horrible and I would sell the RV, okay? That's not why we're doing this thing. We're doing this because we believe there's Christians across this country that can reach into their circle of influence and help the fatherless. You know, if you, if you come here tonight and you hear all these studies about what's, what's going on, you hear the statistics, you hear the scripture about the fatherless, and then you do nothing afterwards. You'd be like one of those movies you watch where it just ends. Do you ever watch one of those movies that just ends? Do you ever see a movie, that, raise your hand if you've seen a movie that just ends. You, they're in a battle scene and there's a, they're, they're fighting and all of a sudden the credits roll and you're like, nobody wins? Or there's a, it's a movie about a, a couple falling in love, right? And they're, they're about to fall in love and, and the credits start rolling and you're like, are you serious right now? 
Are you kidding me right now? Who produced this movie, right? You get angry, you the rest of the, your week's wrecked, you're thinking about this movie and how it should be different, and you're like, I can rewrite this. Who, who made this movie every time it comes on TV? You're like, I, there should be a better ending. It just frustrates you. Who hates movies like that? Raise your hand. Clean, complete opposite from every Hallmark movie ever made. Did you ever see a Hallmark movie? Hallmark movies. A guy or a girl goes to a small town, right? You with me? They come from the big city. They got that big city boyfriend or girlfriend, don't they? Don't they? You, you know what I'm saying? And, and they're, they got that big city boyfriend or girlfriend. They're probably an attorney. Usually they're an attorney, right? And, and they go to this small town. They drive in with their BMW and this country town. And, and then, then they see this country boy or country girl. And at first they don't like them, right? Are you with me? Yeah. They don't like them. They can't stand them. And then they have a job to do. They have to save a cafe or save a factory, don't they? Don't they? Every single one. And so they have a job to do. By the end of the movie, they fall in love with that country boy or country girl. They dump that big city boyfriend or girlfriend, and they save that cafe, and they, or they save that factory. Either one, whatever it might be. Every single Hallmark movie ever made. I hate Hallmark movies, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. My wife likes them, so it's okay. Who likes Hallmark movies? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay, my wife does too. It's okay. Don't get angry at me. I'm just saying that they're all the same. Anyways... Now, I'm not talking about the predictable movies. I'm talking about the unpredictable, where they just end. And you're like, are you serious right now? You know, and it it frustrates you. And if you leave here tonight and you hear all these things about the fodless and you do nothing, you do nothing. You're like one of those movies that you watch and they frustrate you. And so basically you frustrate yourself. I'm just kidding. But they just don't be like that. The next thing is react with a plan. So we got to reject apathy, remit compassion, but react with a plan. Do something. I want to encourage you to do something. I'm so glad this passage didn't end in verse 33, where it says, And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. End of passage. I'm sorry, next verse. (laughs) Next verse, I meant verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And it just ended. Imagine if it just ended there. We would be like, well, what did he do? Did he do anything? Did he help this guy in any way? Thankfully, Jesus gives us the rest of the story. And this is a guide for you, as we close, it's a guide for you on how you can help the fatherless or the hurting people around you. This is from Jesus Christ, okay? Here it is. It's pretty simple. Very simple formula. This is not a complicated thing. This is inviting people into your life using the resources you have to help the people that are hurting around you. Verse 34, and went to him. That's the first step. They say if you don't do something within 48 hours of caring about an issue, you probably won't do anything. So between now and Friday night, do something. Message them, call them, text them. Reach into their life in one way or another. Make a list, a prayer list. Maybe just start praying about it and see how God works in your heart. But do something between now and Friday, Friday night. So I'm gonna get involved in one way or another. It says, and he went to him. Look what he did. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He used his own resources to help him heal and set him in his own beast. He gave him transportation and brought him to an end. He gave him lodging, and he took care of him. He took care of what he was dealing with in his life. And this is the formula for us to help people that are hurting. It says in the verse 35, And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And on, uh, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. You know, he was going to take care of this guy when he was going to be gone. This is a formula for us to help, like I said, the people around you. Who can you help and how can you help them? I guarantee you that if you reach out to the fatherless around you, God will bless it. Is this a prosperity gospel thing? No. But I guarantee you, God cares about the fatherless and if if he uses you to reach into their life, he'll bless you in one way or another. Whether it is peace in your life, joy in your life, I'm not saying financial blessing, I'm saying he will bless you in one way or another. And oftentimes when you reach out to hurting people, people that are around you that need some hope and encouragement, it's going to bless you maybe more than it blesses them. Or maybe equally. Reach into their life. I would not be standing in front of you tonight 
if it wasn't for the individuals that came into my life that helped me. That said, Sean, I care about you. It was very informal. It was just people that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to Sean. There was no formal program. There was no formal help. It was just an organic thing. Like, like I said in the video, my grandparents picked up the pieces when my dad walked away when I was 10 months old. And they helped. And then my grandfather passed away when I was in sixth grade. I was a mess after that. I was struggling through school. I was getting in trouble. And I was, it was my, my grandma and I lived in a house together. A 12-year-old boy and a 60-some-year-old lady living in a house together. Maybe that's your situation. I watched enough Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful to last me a lifetime, okay? And some of you older individuals will get that, okay? That grandma likes soap operas. She liked to watch these soap operas. And I watched Wheel of Fortune with her. And she'd watch Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls with me. And, and we had a good time together, my grandma and I, and had a great time. But I needed some men to step into my life to teach me about being a man. I had my youth pastor. He came into my life and he took me camping for the first time. Took me mud in his truck. I had a guy named Brian who took me hunting. I had a guy named Rob and his wife named Lori that they had an open door policy at their house where I could go, in, go over to their house anytime. It wasn't like they, they announced that, but you just knew Rob and Lori's house was an open door. It was a safe place. And they had kids there. The kids, kids would hang out. They had little kids, but they, teenagers could show up to their house. They just kind of made it, made it that way. And they had an unlimited supply of Mountain Dew, Doritos, and double stuffed Oreos. Okay, So it's a place that teenagers wanted to go. And we could go there and hang out. And then, like I said in the video, I had a couple named Jim and Deb, and they invested in my life. There was no blood relation, no marriage relation in any of these situations, but people just wanted to invest in my life. You can do the same thing for others, and I'm afraid to think of where I would be if it wasn't for the people that God used in my life. And there's so many other kids out there that they need those kind of people. They need some hope, and you can be the solution. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how cool you think you are or, or how, how hip you have to think you have to be. I'm like using words that are old school words, but I'm just saying, it doesn't matter what you think you have to be because Satan's probably lying to you right now. He's probably telling you you don't have time or somebody else will care for that person. Satan's probably lying to you right now saying you don't have enough money or why would you care about them? Somebody else will. He's probably lying to you right now because he does not want us to reach the fatherless. I've seen so much opposition in this ministry because the fatherless have, have been gripped by Satan. They've been gripped by the evil agendas in this nation. And Satan doesn't want them reached, but we as Christians can break that. And we can help them break the cycle in their life. My dad was fatherless growing up. I was fatherless growing up. And through God, I'm trying to break that cycle with my kids. And you can do the same thing by helping somebody break that cycle. Or if you're growing up in that situation, you can determine, I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to let my circumstances determine my future. And I'm going to decide to follow what God has for me. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. Maybe you've already messed up a ton. Through God, you can overcome that. Give your life to God. Find hope in God. Pursue a successful future through God. Grow in God and walk with God. Find some mentors. Pray for people to come into your life to help you. You, know, you can be different. You can overcome and break the cycle in your life. And as individuals, you can help individuals that are struggling through it. You can help single moms and grandparents and grandkids break the cycle in their life. You can help um, the fatherless individuals that they're working with break the cycle in their life. You see what I mean? There's, there's always something you can do with this, this situation of fatherlessness. Figure out what you can do. That, and there's so many different ways you can get involved. And I, so I can't give you one general specific way that you can jump into this. You pray about it. Think about who you can help and then get started. Look with me at the end of this passage here as we close. In verse 36, it says, Jesus asked this guy a question. He says, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. I want to ask you tonight, if somebody, if you're an adult in here, I want to ask you, who came into your life and helped you? Who was it? Was it, was it your parents? Did you have great parents? Maybe you're, maybe you're a teenager tonight and you're thinking, well, I have good parents. 
Who helped you? Maybe, maybe you had a coach in your life. Maybe you had a boss. Maybe you had a teacher. I, I don't know. But if you're in here tonight, you're doing good in life and you're living for God, who helped you? And I want to ask you tonight, will you pay it forward? Will you do the same thing for somebody else? Maybe you're thinking, well, I didn't have anybody help me. Well, at least you're here tonight. So God may have helped you on that path. He, maybe he's the one, the only, the only thing that showed up in your life. And that's all we need. Will you pay it forward? Will you go and do that likewise?